in August. I can remember as a boy growing up how, and, and I grew up in a little house that was converted from a chicken coop ice cellar into a home. And so just a small little place. And um, our bedroom for my brother, my sister, and ourselves, we had two tiny little bedrooms up in what was the attic converted into two bedrooms. And uh, the way they built the home, uh, this chicken coop, uh, they, to get heat up to the top, they put a hole in the floor by the side and then put a grid over it. And so every Christmas, the, um, I knew <clears throat> Christmas morning when I came down, my presents were going to be on this little chair right over here. And uh, my brothers were going to be on the sofa at this end. My sisters were at the sofa down at this end. And um, every Christmas we would go to bed and my parents would say, you can't come down until we tell you you can come down. And uh, so we would go to bed and uh, knowing that grid was there, I would wait until after my parents, sometimes I didn't even wait until after my parents went to bed while they were still bringing the presents out and putting the presents for the, each of us in place. And uh, I would bend over and I would look down through that grid and I could see my little chair just fine. So I had a pretty good idea the kind of presents I was going to get even though many of them were wrapped. But there were times when my brother and sister said, we want to know too, so I had to take the grid off and stick my head down through the hole to be able to look around, see what they were going to get. And um, I can remember Christmas morning, it was usually at 7 o'clock, my parents would, would say, okay, you can come down now. Well, we already knew what we were going to get, but we came down. And the, um, my parents, while the three of us were in our place, and in some homes they say, open the presents one at a time, go around one at a time. Wasn't that way in our place? It was go. And so all of us would just start to thrash and pull paper and, and, and get everything off. My parents sat in the side in two chairs, my dad's lazy boy chair and my mom had hers there right beside him. And they would sit and not do anything but watch their children with a smile on their face over the great joy that they were seeing as the children opened up the presents that they had gotten for them. You know what? Our Father in Heaven has given us wonderful gifts and what a joy it is to Him when He sees us enjoying the gifts that He has given. Isn't that right, sister? What a beautiful thought. And I'd imagine this morning, as our Father looks down over the balconies of heaven at this little church, at all of the little churches that are going on right now, our heart of our Father is warm, and He has great joy. You know, in the spirit of prophecy, there are two places that says, when we come to Him and we address Him as Father, it is music to His ears. Isn't that rich? It's music to his ears. As beautiful as the music was here this morning. Our Father, when we simply say, Father, it's music to his ears. So this morning we're going to quickly look at three of the most beautiful gifts that God has given us. So now if this will work, and good so far. Here's the first one, the gift of creation. God gave us the gift of creation. On day one he created light. Day two, the heavens. Day three, the earth, the grass, the trees, the herbs, and the sea. Day four, the sun, the moon. He gave us day and night. Day five, the sea creatures. And then day six. You know, the first five days, after every day, God looked back, and he looked to see what he had created, and he said what? That is good. He said, that is good. Five times, that is good. But day six, when God finished his work on day six, with the work of creating people, men and women. And I think it was right after he created woman. He didn't just say, that is good. What did he say? He said, that is very good. And Adam said, that's right. That is very good. And uh, what a joy to see the, um, the women in the church. When I was in Colorado as superintendent, the, uh, we had 17 little churches in Wyoming. And uh, the, most of them had church schools. But those churches would have closed if it were not for one woman 
who said, no, we're not going to let this church close. We're going to keep this church going. Women have a very special place in the heart of our fathers. Day seven, that's why we're here today. On the seventh day, God said, I'm going to set this aside as a memorial for all that I've given you, this beautiful gift of creation. I'm going to set this aside, and this is going to be a special gift every week where you and I are going to get together and look back at this gift, but also the next gift coming up. And that is the gift of Jesus who came and died for you and for me. The beautiful gift of us being drawn back into relationship with our Father in Heaven. Oh. You know, we're having trouble. Can you just push them by, by hand? I'll just say click. So, <laughs> uh, go the other direction. Well, I'm convinced Satan doesn't want you to hear this message this morning. He really doesn't want you to hear the message this morning. Try a couple more times, and if this isn't working... No, it's going the wrong way. It's going back. I, I put a, a sermon in front of this one. Can you go forward with it now? No, still got to go the other direction. Yeah, he really doesn't want to hear you to hear this this morning. But um, the Holy Spirit impressed me to number one, put it on a flash drive, and number two, put it in a hard copy. So you're going you're gonna to get it. He's not going to win today. You're going to get it anyway. Second gift God gave us was the gift of his own son. Talked about the first gift was the gift of creation. The second gift was the gift of his only begotten son. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who? That whosoever that whosoever believeth in him. Yeah. That's how simple it is. And believing in him is not a matter is not a matter of us giving our mental agreement to yes, Jesus came and died. When we say we believe in him, what it's talking about is we have this trusting relationship. And I believe that we're getting so close to the second coming of Jesus that it's only that trusting relationship that is going to take us from here when every other visible means of support is taken away. It'll be that relationship, that trusting relationship that God will take care of us, he will provide, and that he will take us through. Second part of that verse, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, through Christ, might be saved. That's the second gift, the gift of his own Son. And then the third gift that's so important is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And our church, and I believe Christians in general, are just waking up to the importance of the Holy Spirit and the work that he does to bring us into an abiding relationship with Christ. The gift of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit bring to us? First of all, it says that the Holy Spirit, oh, we're trying, that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. That's one of the works of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that convicts us of sin. Secondly, it's the Holy Spirit who does the work of sanctification, of gradually changing us into the very image of Jesus. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Jesus. Number three, the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that brings Christ to live in us. The Bible tells us you have the mind of Christ. If you believe in him, you have the mind of Christ. My problem is I don't choose to have the mind of Christ all the time. 
I tend to the old song that says, I'm prone to wander. I'm prone to leave the God I love. But God says, I want to give you the, whole, the, the mind of Christ continually. Next one. The Holy Spirit is God's delivery being. The, um, every day at my house, it's not a delivery man. We used to talk about the delivery man, the mailman, the mailman. Now it's the delivery person. And uh, in our case, it happens to be a lady that comes by every day to deliver the mail. And uh, this delivery lady, early in the morning, she will pick up from the headquarters my mail and she'll put it in her vehicle, she'll drive it around, and then she will place it in my mailbox. That's her job. She is the delivery lady for the Postal Service. The Holy Spirit is our Father's delivery being who brings to us, the next slide, he delivers to us the mind of Christ. He's the one that brings us the character of Jesus. He's the one that brings a passion to love others just as Christ loves them. It's the Holy Spirit that brings Christ to live in you and to live in me. And that's why every day I'm learning at my old age that I need to pray a pre-prayer before I pray my morning prayers. And the pre-prayer is simply, Father, I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit because without your Holy Spirit, I don't even know what to pray for. And I don't even know how to praise you. So I'm asking you, Father, to give me your Holy Spirit and then you inspire my thoughts in how to praise you, how to adore you, how to confess, what do I need to confess, how do I, am I thankful for, what am I thankful for, and then supplication, starting with my own children, my grandchildren, and then others that the Holy Spirit brings me to. That's all the work of the Holy Spirit. Next one. What's our part? Our part is to accept God's three gifts and invite Jesus to come and live in us each day. Love this quote. Well, that's, a, that's an illustration. I'll just tell you very quickly. Uh, back, oh, three years ago now, uh, maybe four, my, my son-in-law called me on Sunday morning and said, Gary, can you come and help me? And uh, I went. He was tearing down a wall in the house, and he's putting in a, a header to, because it was a stress-bearing wall. And so he tore down this, uh, this wall. We tore it down. Uh, we put the header in. We sat back, as men's do. We opened the can of pop. And uh, we looked, we admired our work and said, that is good. Didn't say it's very good, we said that is good. And um, <clears throat> then we invited my daughter to come home and look at it. Lori walked in and Lori gave one of those looks that was kind of like this. <laughs> and uh, as soon as I saw that look, uh, I thought, man, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> and so I went back home and I knew it would only be a matter of a little bit of time when Tom would call and he did. And he said, uh, Gary, I said, yeah. He said, uh, can you come back again? And I said, why? And he said, Lori said we put the header in the wrong place. Now, Dale would never do something like that. Candy would never have to say to Dale, do this over again. We had put it in the wrong place. It was set up so this was to, um, to be a, 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 a top beam that comes across as an invisible divider for the dining room and the family room. And uh, where we put the header, when you put the couch just in front of it so it's right down from the header, you can't get through the garage door. And so Lori looked at that, as soon as she saw that, she said, that's got to go. And uh, we spent more time taking that out again before we could put it in right. And the moral of the, parent, the story parents is this, you get one opportunity, you get one opportunity to raise your children. Make sure that you are doing everything you can possibly do, trusting in Jesus for this, but to give them every opportunity to know him as their savior, because only what's done for Christ will last. Amen? That's why this school, Grand Rapids Adventist Academy, is so important. It's on a special mission, and you can know, you can know that Satan is doing everything. The teachers this last week, they were making their lesson plans. Satan had his lesson plans for the whole year lined up on how he's going to attack them, and how he's going to tear them down, and how he's going to destroy everything that God wants to do in that school this year. And uh, by, by God's grace and through your faithful prayers as church members and your continued support for your teachers, you've got to keep lifting them up, holding them up before God and not let Satan win that one either. Next one. 
Why is it so important? You may have seen this before, go to the next one. Back years ago, Barna Research did a study, and Barna Research is out of Minnesota. They did a study to find out what the best time for people to give their heart to the Lord, to start a relationship with Jesus was. Look at this, this is why your school is so important. First one, probability of accept, people accepting Jesus, click. At age five to 13, that's grade, that's preschool, up through eighth grade, okay? There's a 32% rate of probability that kids will give their heart to Jesus during that time. This is Protestantism in general, not just the Adventist Church. Adventist Church was part of this general study. Look what happens when they go to the academy, 14 to 18, it drops down to a 4% rate of probability that kids in that bracket will give their hearts to Jesus. And then, next one, from age 19 to death, only a 6% rate of probability that people will give their hearts to Jesus ever again. So the bottom line, click. If a person does not accept Christ by age 14, the likelihood of them doing so diminishes drastically. That's why this church school is so important. Why God has set this church school. He has ordained, set us apart for a holy purpose, this little school that you folks have. Next one. What are the five key things where children need to know? Go ahead and click. I like this quote. They have it on the wall at Andrews Academy. It says, to restore in, I, I call it students, to restore in students the image of Christ is the object of education and the great object of life. So number one, things they know. They will know from experience that they are a son or a daughter of God. Click. Here it is, Romans 8, 16, for the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. There's the Holy Spirit again. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in what? His glory. Going to be trouble coming going to be trouble coming. But he says, hey, stay close to Jesus. Go through the trouble with me. Let me hold your hand to take you through it, and you will share in my glory as well. Next, when it comes, when we come to God with our needs and we dress him as Father, it's music to our ears. I shared that earlier. Click. Our Father calls us to teach children and youth about their true identity. Look at this. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. It is not possible to rise to a higher level of dignity than is here implied. Have you noticed how there's very little dignity in the world today? You see how the Democrats and the Republicans go at each other? It's, it's, it's wicked, it's hateful, it's spiteful, it's evil. We are seeing the Holy Spirit being gradually withdrawn from the world. And as the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn, we are beginning to see what happens when God starts to remove his presence from this world. And it's not very long, folks. We don't have very much longer to go before Jesus comes back and saves us from all of this wickedness that's happening around us. Number two. Our children and youth, they will experience a relationship with their big brother and know what he did for them. I like this, Matthew 23, 37, it says, as a mother hen gathers her chicks under his wings, metaphor that Jesus described in his relationship with us. You know, I had, uh, yesterday I was helping a friend working on their house and they have a chicken coop in the back. And uh, in this chicken coop, the, um, if a fox were to break into that chicken coop and a mother hen saw the fox coming, what weapons does a mother hen have to protect her little ones from the attacks of a fox? She has nothing. And so a mother hen spreads her wings. She draws all of her little chicks in under those wings, covering them from the sight of the fox with the plan that the fox will take her life in order that she might be able to save those little chicks. And friends, that's what every mother does. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus came to this earth. He spread his arms upon a cross. He said to each one of us, come in under my arms. And then he looked Satan in the eye and he said, go ahead. 
kill me. He did that for you. And we're told that if there were only one, he still would have done that. Brother, if it was just you, he would have done that. What an amazing God. What an amazing elder brother that we have. Christ glorified is our brother in Desire of Ages, page 25. Heaven's enshrined in humanity, and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. When you're going through the stuff, and we're all going through or will be going through or have gone through the stuff, God says, I will wrap my arms around you, child. I won't stop you from going through it, but I will wrap my arms around you, and I will go through it with you. What a God we serve. Next one. Our Father's called to teach our children and youth about the love of our big brother for them. Jesus did not consider heaven a place he'd be desired while you were lost. He left the heavenly courts for a life of reproach and insult and death and shame. What an amazing thing. Next. Number three, they'll begin to discover God's call for their lives. God never leaves his children. Hold on this one. God never leaves his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the what? The glory of the purpose that they are fulfilling as who? Co-workers with Jesus. Do you realize every day he's saying, child, I want you to hook up with me. And if you hook up with me, you will be a co-worker with me. Teachers, when you go into the school, you're going as a co-worker of Jesus into that school. Eric, it's not you going in. It's Christ going in there through you. And he's saying, I will use you. I will make you the visible part of who I am to those students, to those children every day. I will do my work through you. What a joy, what a privilege to be able to sit back at the end of the day and, and let the Holy Spirit just bring thoughts to you and you say, wow, yeah, you're, he did that through me. He let me be part of his work to smile at somebody, to help somebody, do something for somebody. The, um, what denomination does the best job of retaining its youth and children all the way up to adulthood? Take a guess. Don't, don't bring this up yet. Take a guess. Vern, what do you think? SDA. SDA? Boy, I wish we could say that. I wish we could say that. Sister? The Mormons? No, it's not the Mormons. The what? The Amish? No, the Amish, not the Amish, but the Amish do have a distinction. The Amish, because of their family and their togetherness, um, the research shows that they have the least amount of depression. Isn't that interesting? We well, can learn from that. But it's not the Amish. Anybody else? The Catholic? It's not the Catholics. Let's show them who it is. It's the Latter-day Saints. It's the Amish. Where's this lady right here? This lady right here. She's not looking at me now. This lady right here. You got it right. It was the, it was the Amish. You know, they changed their name. Back when people started saying, you know, they're polygamous. Don't, make, don't get close to them. Yeah, the Mormons. Yeah, the, I'm sorry, the Mormons. I'm an old man. <laughs> the Mormons, they changed their name and call themselves the Latter-day Saints. But in the last few years, they're going back and saying, no, we're not the Latter-day Saints. We're the Mormons. So, terrible message. But um, they're doing some things that we can learn from. And one of those things, I saw years ago, I saw a, a TV show was on the, um, on the Mormons. And uh, after the break, it came back and they had these kids. You know the song, Abraham had many sons? Many sons had Father Abraham. It wasn't that song, but it was the uh, Mormon uh, song that was that very similar to that. And they had kids that were three years old, up to 18 years old. And they were singing a song that says, God has a purpose for my life. There's something God has for me to do. We need to be teaching that in our schools, in our homes, in the church, that there's something very special God has for every child. And even for old people like me, there's still something special he has for me to do. He will always have a purpose for his children. Always. Next. Our Father calls us to teach our children and youth that he has a special thing he wants them to do. Go ahead. I like this text. For we are God's workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance before you were ever born. God said, child, here's what I have lined up for your life. And when you get off base and you go into this direction and not the way he wanted, uh, he says, okay, plan B. I've already planned that for you too. And uh, you've gone this direction, plan C, I've got that one covered for you as well. Before you were ever born, God put together what he wants for my life, for your life. Next. Common mission. We have a common mission. When Jesus was going back, two angels said, there's one thing God wants you to do. And that one thing was what? Go and make disciples. He said that is it. Go and make disciples. And that's why we have schools. Our schools, students at, at Grand Rapids Adventist Academy, God has a specific plan for your life. He wants you to grow up, but he wants you to go and share the good news of what he's doing in your life. That's a common mission, just telling people, here's who Jesus is to me. Here's what Jesus is doing for me. That's something we all do as we find out what it is he wants us to specifically do with our lives. Next one. Number four, he'll understand that their lives are not to be squandered on self. We do not, as followers of Christ, realize our true position. Look at this. All of the good things. How many? All. All of the good things we have are what? They're on loan from Jesus. He has made us stewards of the gifts, the talents. Next one. This includes our skills, our abilities, our influence, our time, our treasure. Everything we have is on loan from Christ and is to be used for his agenda as the Holy Spirit prompts you. You are to use all of the gifts that you have, everything that you have, to be a faithful steward for him. Amen? Amen. Next one. Last one, they will understand Christ's plan to use them here and throughout eternity. I really like this one. Trophy, definition of a trophy. Trophy is a trophy is something that's taken from the enemy and kept as a memorial of the victory. Something taken from the enemy and set up as a memorial of the victory. Look at this from Heavenly Places. On Christ's coronation day, when we get home, on Christ's coronation day, he will give his faithful ones crowns of immortal glory. In that day, the redeemed will shine forth the glory of the Father and his Son. The angels of heaven, touching their golden harps, will welcome the king and those who are the trophies of his victory from down here. Look at this. We are the trophies that Christ has taken from the enemy. And when we get home, we will be his memorial. The reminder to the universe that what he did for us was worth it all. What an amazing thing. I'm told in the spirit of prophecy that Christ will take us from planet to planet and there he will show us off as his reward for what happened down here. What a beautiful thought. Next. Best gifts ever given. Creation, the gift of Jesus, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of of, um, of, the, of Jesus, but look at this. These gifts will amount to nothing if we don't choose to accept them every day. For God so loved the world, say it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Next. Future of society. This is very important. We all believe that we're close to the second coming. Amen? This world is going on a slippery slope downhill very rapidly. Look at this. The future of society will be determined by who? The youth of today. Why is this school important? Look at this. Satan is making earnest efforts, persevering efforts to corrupt the mind and debase the character of how many? Every youth. 
And shall we who have more experience stand as mere spectators and see him accomplish his purpose without a hindrance? Let us stand at a post as minutemen to work for these youth and through the help of God to hold them back from the pit of destruction. Satan is gathering an army of youth. Look at that. Christ is gathering an army of youth, so is Satan. And the fact of the matter is, Satan's army of youth is much greater than the army of youth that Christ of Christ's uh, group. Let us stand as a postman. Satan is gathering an army of youth under his banner, and he exalts, for through them he carries on his warfare against God. And that's why this church school is so important. Every day, there's going to be a battle going on in your little church school, both collectively as a school as a whole and individually in the minds of every student attending, every child. S Satan will be vying to take them away from Christ and the Holy Spirit will be saying, no child, draw close to Jesus, draw close to God and he will draw close to you. And that's why this church school that you folks have here is so important. You know, I've, uh, uh, Pastor Stewart is a dear brother, and I hold him in high regard. And he will do evangelistic series in this church. But don't ever forget, remember that slide I showed you, the rate of probability once we go from 19 to, a, to the time of your death? Only a 6% rate of probability. And yet, as a church in North America, almost all of our money goes towards public evangelism. And I don't believe that was ever God's plan. I believe God's plan. Well, it's found in Ministry of Healings, page 143. It says, Christ's method alone will give true success in soul winning. And here they are, the big four. Jesus mingled with people as one who desired their good. Can you do that? Mingle with people as one who desires their good? Number two, he showed them sympathy. Can you do that? Number three, he met their needs as best he could. Can you do that? Number four, he won their confidence. How did he win their confidence? Because he did the first three. He mingled with them, took an interest in them, and, and met their needs and helped them, just got close to them. He won their confidence. And then the last thing he did, and teachers, I've, I've I'm guilty of, when I was in education, this is where I lost it. The last thing he did, he bid them follow me. When he had a relationship in place where they said, wow, there's something about you that's different. You're not in this relationship for anything you can get out of it. You're in it because you sincerely and genuinely love me. Why do you do that? What makes you tick? Then Jesus said, let me tell you about my father. Let me tell you who I am, what I came to do and how God is doing something very special to love you and bring you into a relationship with him. At this time, and I'm just, um, I'm just um, processing this, I'm going to ask two things. Just stay seated for right now, but I'm going to ask the teachers and then all of the support staff and then all of the board members for the church school to stand. And I'm looking for one student one student would be willing to come up and pray for your teachers this school year. One student. Who will do it? One student. Looking for one student that will stand up here and pray for your teachers and pray for your school. Do we have one? One student. Takes courage to do this. But remember this. Getting up. Come on up, brother. Standing up for Jesus will never, ever, ever be an easy thing. Because as soon as you stand up for Jesus, all eyes are on you. And Satan is going to use people to try and tear you down. Is there a microphone up here? Here we go.
What's your name? Gideon. Gideon. Gideon is a mighty man of valor. Amen. And uh, we're going we're gonna to pray for you as you're praying for your teachers and for your school, Gideon. And uh, before we do that, well, let me just speak in this mic for a second. Before we do that, first I'd like all of the teachers, part-time, full-time teachers, please stand. See, it's hard for teachers to get up too. And now all of the support staff at the school, I want you to stand. And lastly, all of those that serve on the school board, giving general guidance to the school, I want you to stand. Okay? Gideon's going to pray, and then I'm going to follow up with a prayer right after that, so just stand. Dear Jesus, thank you for bringing us, and please be with our teachers, help them, keep them safe, and help them teach us about you every day, and help us learn more about you, and keep them safe with wherever they're going through, and help them be better in everything they do, and thank you for giving us them, and thank you for giving us a school, in Jesus' name, amen. Holy Father, you've heard Gideon's prayer, and with that I add my prayer. Father, I know that this school is going to be under attack, but you have promised that he who is with us is so much greater than he that is with the world. And so I'm claiming victory this next school year, first for the teachers. Father, you have prepared them academically to share the content area, and that's very important, but it's not the most important. The most important, Father, is that you place your Holy Spirit in them every day as they go to school and that they realize that they go as co-workers with Jesus that he will be revealed through them and so father I pour for you pray for your blessing upon each of them and then father the support staff they too are in positions to reflect Christ or to be a distraction to Christ father I pray that you will fill them with your Holy Spirit and that you'll just do something through them to draw the hearts of the children into a closer relationship with you. And Father, the school board, as the school board makes decisions this year, I pray that they will do so with the mind of Christ, that Jesus will so permeate each board meeting that people will be looking, saying, what can we do to strengthen? What can we do to make this uh, a better school for Christ? What is it you would have us to do, Father? So I pray for your blessing upon them. And Father, I think of the students at the school that are coming to the school now. And Father, if there are any more that need to be there, I pray your Holy Spirit will work on the hearts of the parents and uh, grandparents or guardians and bring those additional students to the school that they can be part of this heavenly mission, this heavenly assignment that you have to carry out this school year. And lastly, Father, I pray for the parents and I pray for the guardians. And I just ask, Father, that in the home, that they will grow in their relationship with you, that the Holy Spirit will take them deeper and deeper in understanding your love for them and your assignment that they are to be faithful stewards in raising their children first to know you and have a relationship with you. So Father, I just pray for your, your spirit to be poured out over the school at Grand Rapids this year. Let it all be done in a way that brings you the honor and the glory. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.